As we found out last week, Dragon Ball's filler is a magical experience that drags you from the depths of predictable tedium to the most preposterously ambitious. And sometimes we even get some good stuff thrown in there too. Last week I was tasked with watching over 8 hours of classic Dragon Ball's filler material. It was tough, however I did mention that Dragon Ball Z's filler was much longer. How much longer you ask? One hour? Two hours, maybe 15, 15 hours. hours. Unlike the stuff I got to watch last week, I've actually seen all of this already, I think. Though not in roughly 20 years. So this will be as much a surprise for you guys as it will be for me, no doubt. So strap in for some garlic, some bad driving lessons, and some snake way shenanigans because today we're finishing the filler of Dragon Ball in style. watch my last video, you should, you monster, but also let me remind you what we're considering filler in this video. For the sake of my sanity and time, we will not be covering drawn out extensions in canon episodes. So no lengthy stare downs or Bulma chasing a frog around while Goku punches Frieza. We're looking for proper standalone episodes and mini arcs, and with that I'll be looking to see whether said filler arcs and episodes will do one of two things. Number one, will they implement their own creativity without getting in the way of the canon story? Or number two, will they avoid conflict with the main story so much so that they just end up being criminally boring? There's a, there's a little gray area in there and that's where you operate. Granted, this is an almost impossible balancing act to pull off effectively, but hey, we got some diamonds last week, and like I said that time, I'm expecting most of this to be utter dog sh iffy at best. So if we can come away from this video with one or two gems, then I'll consider it a roaring success. Let's do this! Preparing for the Saiyans. Being a robot, I will never die, and I will never be able to experience the sweet release of death. The world is a lie. Existence is a lie. There is only pain and darkness beyond this point. These were the first pieces of filler I ever engaged with in my life. At the annoying age of 9 years old, I saw this collection of episodes for the very first time and outside of the snake way stuff with Goku, I honestly had little interest. So you might be shocked to find out that upon revisit, I actually enjoyed myself quite a bit more than I thought I would with this material. With 9 episodes to explore, this filler arc places a microscope over the very training that was skipped over with the likes of Gohan, the gang at the lookout, the journey Goku undertakes on his way to King Kai's, and the Saiyans even get their own crappy little segment. Can you guess which one of those four stories I didn't like? It certainly has its ups and downs, but what this material offered Gohan I thought was quite great, all things considered, with plenty of subtle writing, symbolism, and lessons for the young man to contend with as he tries to survive in the wilds of Earth, grappling with monsters, hunger, and his growing sense of moral obligation. Let's take a look at Gohan's training. Hey there, have you heard about my robot friend? He's metal and small and doesn't judge me at all. He's a cyber wire bundle of joy, my robot friend. Towards the beginning of my obnoxiously long review of Dragon Ball Z's Saiyan Saga, I noted that it appeared clear Toriyama didn't want fans to consider Gohan anything other than Goku's opposite. Fearful, polite beyond his years, and generally helpless. He demonstrated all the attributes his father never exhibited. In the manga, the first steps away from this approach are dealt with through off-screen training and hardship to bring him up to par with the rest of the gang. This is of course to create a sense that Gohan is now ready, and while that works remarkably well in the manga, I think a lot of the material added to Gohan's story here offers a wonderfully natural and emotional progression for us to follow as an alternative. A coming of age story with a beginning, middle, and surprisingly enough, an end too. But while it's cool seeing Gohan doing all of these next level cool things, sometimes you just want to be able to do the cool things yourself. Well, that's what video games are for! You know those mad lads over at Hoyoverse who made Genshin Impact that basically broke the internet? Well, they've only gone on to make another amazing game, introducing Honkai Star Rail! I know, I know, you've probably heard all about how great it is at this point, but this multi-platform space hopping adventure just got a big ol' update and it's a great time to jump in. The first of the two brand new characters in this update is Jing Lu. This badass blindfolded mommy has a little secret under there. Those red eyes are cold as ice and goddamn does she deal some punishing damage. Coming up at the end of the month are the dynamic duo Topaz and Numbi. This cute little imp girl might look meek, but she's a smart businesswoman and if you cross her, she'll summon Numbi to kick your ass. This is all part of Honkai's 1.4 update that jumps back into the depths of Bellabog with an all new story, featuring two new maps and the return of Zila. 
If you log in for seven days, you can get 10 Star Rail Special Passes for free, and that's a great way of pulling these new characters. But there's actually more to it than that. The update kicks off the Ethereum Wars where you can pit your favorite monsters against one another. There's so much variety that really makes for a great experience for both new and existing players. Now, if that sounds good, then be sure to check out the links below to download Honkai Star Rail today. And if you use my promo code on the screen right now, you get 50 free Stellar Jades. Once again, my link is in the description and it's entirely free. Episode 9 kicks things off as we see Gohan accidentally fall into a cavern where he discovers an old robot. What's wonderful about this episode to me is its measured and subtle dialogue. Written by Katsuyuki Sumisawa, a name to keep in mind going forward, he establishes the pattern by which Gohan reluctantly but consistently marches down henceforth. Activating the robot out of fear, Gohan cries out for safety, food, emotional support, and answers to all of his problems long before thinking to ask the robot about himself. Self. This is terrific characterization and paints Gohan as a total self-obsessed crybaby, as all small children mostly are. It's a wonderful starting point from which to measure his progression against, not just in this episode, but the rest of this mini arc. When the robot responds, Gohan develops a fondness for it. Having not left the cavern out of fear before, what keeps him there now is his desire to find a solution that allows his new robot friend to get out of there with him. Tragically, the room they reside within starts to fall apart, and with the roof crashing down around them, in order to save Gohan's life, the robot is forced to throw him out the only gap to safety against his will. All the young boy can do then is watch as his friend fades from the world. Gohan is left crying and alone to feel sorry for himself once again again. It's a remarkably somber scene, one that is capped off by Gohan smiling through his tears, knowing that he couldn't save his friend or himself. Episode 10 builds off of these established foundations. This time, we're not greeted by a crying child, an apprehensive and skittish child, sure, but nowhere near the catastrophe of cribbing we endured in episodes prior. And symbolically, this episode is a juggernaut. It's established early on that Gohan is applying lessons his father taught him in order to survive in the wild. The through line of this episode is this medicinal patch he fixes for both himself and his injured dinosaur friend that he discovers later on. Gohan even echoes his father's own words to this dinosaur. It's a cute dialogue callback, but it also pulls double duty, insinuating that Gohan is trying and in some way succeeding in being more like his father. And while he's still faking it until he makes it, he's clearly making progress here. And there's tons of visual symbolism all over this episode to reinforce that point. Gohan is seen jumping from branch to branch, like Goku, dealing with animals he otherwise would never have meddled with before, like Goku does, catching fish, jumping from great heights, or even demonstrating great strength on purpose. Where the first few chapters of Dragon Ball Z's manga demonstrated how different Gohan was, this episode shows us that he might be more like his father than we thought and even he thought. That is, only for our expectations to then be subverted once again at this episode's closing. Unable to protect his friend from the dangers of this world, he wakes up to find nothing left of him. Once again, Gohan is forced to contend with the cruelty of this world and how important it is for him to have the strength to protect those he cares for. He walks off once again towards his future alone. But what makes this segment, this training arc that he undergoes, so compelling to me is that throughout the material I've discussed, Gohan's goal has remained the same. It hasn't been to train or toughen himself up, that's been Piccolo's goal for him. For Gohan, it has been instead to make his own way back to his mother, to reject this training, to go back to safety and away from the dangers of this world. The final part of Gohan's filler material concerns this confrontation he has with the current desires he has. And truthfully, the way they went about it, I very much appreciate it. Discovered by a commune of orphans in a deserted town, Gohan is taken in and alongside this crew looks out for each other while performing dishonest acts in order to feed themselves. The group is led by an older kid, P Pie Piegero, I don't know. And while it's revealed that Gohan wishes to go home, Pigero offers for them all to join Gohan on his journey back to Mount Pauzu in a car. A car they will steal. 
Through doing so, they all get captured by this universe's version of Child Protective Services before Gohan and Pigero make their escape. Gohan, confused and rather upset at this suspected betrayal, can't understand why he would do such a thing to his friends and family. In response to this, Pigero says that they are already getting into too much trouble with him, that they are still young and can make something of themselves this way. And with that tearful send-off, Gohan is sent to run home. Now mere yards away from his house, he stops himself, looks at his mom through the window, and runs back. I love this conclusion because it's a valuable lesson for Gohan to learn, that sometimes people are placed in circumstances they don't understand or enjoy, but in the long run, it's for the best. And now running away from his home, the place he's wanted to go since the very beginning of this filler material, he thinks back to the robot, the dinosaur, the kids, all the people he couldn't help, and the people he was too weak or weak-minded to protect or understand. It's at this moment Piccolo confronts him, asking him one question, what is your mission? Gohan responds with absolute certainty, to defeat the Saiyans and save the Earth. What an incredible story. I cannot say the same for the next one though, the Saiyans. While I had a lot of praise for the decisions made around Gohan's filler material, I can't say I have similar sentiments to share for Vegeta's and Nappa's brief escapades on planet Arlia, simply because it doesn't elevate the canon material in my book. In fact, I would argue it actually gets in the way of it, making it worse. Where Gohan's story walked us along a compelling tale of a young man searching for the courage and confidence to keep fighting, the Saiyans' time spent on this alien world only serves to spoil what was going to be their introduction on Earth. To refresh your memories, when they arrive on Earth in the manga, we are stunned by the scope of their power and cruelty right off the bat. Nappa through his annihilation of an entire city and Vegeta through his intelligence and his ruthlessly cold-hearted approach with the Cybermen. These are compelling moments of character revelation and they work because we value this planet and we value who they are fighting against. But on Arlia, we have no idea who these characters are, nor are we really given much of a reason to care. The world is already a wasteland and in ruin, with the limited life there acting as hostiles or captives by the ruling body. The elements of their character I spoke on from the manga are all used here, almost in the exact same way for Vegeta and Nappa, but it's worse. The best aspect of this Saiyan subplot is that it's mercifully short, not even a full episode in length, but even with that, it elevates nothing and in some ways makes what happens later less effective in my book by spoiling what the Saiyans ultimately do. The Earth's Forces. Another element these filler episodes facilitated, which I think enriches the canon experience during the Saiyan invasion, has to be this added exposure we get to the secondary characters. Getting to see what Yamcha's been up to with baseball, with Bulma and how he's jonesing for a fight again. Seeing Ten Shinhan doing his thing with Chaozu and running into launch once again. All of these added scenes offer a sense that not only are these people valiant and ready to fight for Earth, but additionally emphasizes what they will ultimately be leaving behind. Their friends and their loved ones when they meet their eventual inevitable end during the Saiyan invasion. It's a nice place to root their characters before the canon material continues onward. Furthermore, the training we see these folks undergo is fun, if not a little on the strange side. From the outset, it's clear that while they claim that this is the same room Goku used, if you've seen the Room of Time before, it's clearly not the same room he used, unless they did some major remodeling since Goku's heavenly training alongside Mr. Popo. That said, I love the lookout so much that I'll just about take anything I can from it. Although brief, I'm very much a fan of what this added exposure offered. It bonds us a little more to the characters before, you know, they bite the dust later. I think I'm ready to give my score in this training arc for the Saiyans, but we've got one stop left. Goku and Snake Way. Since I was a little kid watching this show for the very first time, Goku's adventures in Snake Way, much like the other prominent favorites in Dragon Ball's filler library, has remained a personal favorite of mine. And although I haven't looked at much of it in almost two decades, returning it today only reminded me of how much I actually loved it. For me, my favorite experiences with Goku come about through his engagement with other characters. And for those like myself who hadn't seen Dragon Ball as a kid, it's easy to see how Goku started to feel like a character that would disappear for a long time interspersed with brief stints of activity. Z starts and immediately he's dead. He runs alone on Snake Way. He travels to Namek alone. He spends ages in the rejuvenation tank alone. And once he defeats Frieza, he again disappears. And so when I look at things through that lens, I think it's easy to see why I loved Snake Way. 
It's not that it offers Goku any meaningful story advantages like Gohan or the supporting cast received. Instead, it's just one of a few opportunities we get in early Dragon Ball Z to exist and have fun with this character. Plus, it's super fun! The idea that there's a street cleaner on Snake Way is a joke so good I had to mention it in my ultimate review of the series. Goku's falling off Snake Way and into hell only to escape and have to start the path all over again from Enma's desk was hilarious and the entanglement he gets into with Princess Snake was beautifully animated with a fun fish out of water type feel. Otherworld is another one of those areas in Dragon Ball's mythos that I wish got a little bit more time spent on it and this filler material gave me just that. I knew I was gonna like the Snake Way stuff but outside of the escapades with Nappa and Vegeta I gotta say this filler arc was very strong. As filler goes I think I have to give it an 8 out of 10. Super strong start from Dragon Ball Z. And the next arc is... Fake Namek! After that super strong start, it's only fair I get a reality check that confirms how tiresome this entire enterprise is going to be. This trip to Namek, colloquially known as the Fake Namek arc, is boring! And not because it's filler, but because it's BORING! Everything from how it's written to how it's presented. Now something that was brought to the forefront of my mind while watching this particular batch of filler episodes is how substantially role the context you watch this material plays in dictating your enjoyment. For instance, when I was a kid, I didn't want to see the training Gohan underwent surviving in the wild prior to the invasion, I wanted to see the invasion. However, because I went into this video project with the express mission of watching the filler episodes only, they no longer were seen as obstacles to wade through begrudgingly by myself, but instead they became the destination. And because of that, I was able to enjoy the self-contained story offered to Gohan in the prior filler portion. However, the self-contained story of the fake Nemec material is specifically about how often they can be delayed on their way which isn't fun. The first two episodes emphasize how long it's taken to get to where they need to go. It is boring with a capital B. In the first episode, nothing happens apart from them just hitting a roadblock and they get abducted into the ship. Nothing else. N uh, Krillin and Gohan clean up after Bulma. There's nothing else. It's a story that feels like it only has enough material for one episode at a stretch. It's just not a fun watch and I didn't care about the kids on this spaceship either. It does offer some shine to Frieza and Kiwi, but it's not necessary or enjoyable in my opinion. The only conflict is a meteor shower. And finally, episodes three to six. The fake Namek episode is a cute one, but even that ends up with you finding out that this has been a massive waste of time. Furthermore, because this is all set up, there's once again no conflict in the first episode, the second episode, or really the third episode. Finding the Dragon Balls is relatively easy here, and even the canon material interspersed within this is stretched. Vegeta is healed almost immediately in the manga, but he's in this healing tank for ages in these episodes. The idea behind the fake Namek stuff, like I said, is fine, but it goes on for the length of an average feature length film. It is far, far too long, dragging its feet to an obvious conclusion that exists purely as an obstacle en route to Namek, which sucks. I really didn't enjoy these ones. It's, it's awful. Two out of ten. Next. Garlic Jr. Maybe this is controversial, and I don't know who needs to hear this out there, but the Garlic Jr. saga isn't bad. It's actually pretty good. I mean, turning the supporting cast into demon vampire zombies is honestly kinda awesome, and if I'm being totally fair, in any way whatsoever, let's just say setting it in the lookout guarantees I'll love it. Jokes aside, this is exactly the sort of filler I look for, and I was pretty surprised by its quality when viewed in this standalone context. This is a story penned exclusively by one person, Katsuyuki Sumisawa, and that singular vision results in a coherent, well-explored story that, to me, is actually a lot better than the movie material that inspired it. This isn't bastardizing a pre-existing idea, it's leveraging our prior understanding and expectations to create subversions that are genuinely well executed, subversions that reveal character in beautiful ways. It all leads in quite naturally from the previous episode where Goku refuses the wish to bring him back to Earth. It's a time of relative peace and the arc kicks off by exploring what exactly our heroes actually do during these brief moments of respite. For Gohan, it's fetching dinner every day in a lovely sequence reminiscent of the opening of the original Dragon Ball series. For Krillin, it's uh, dressing up like your local pimp and picking up cuties apparently. And for Piccolo, well, much like the filler from the Saiyan saga, he's still an edgy boy beating himself up in the dark stretches of the wilderness. Probably listening to hybrid theory on repeat just to guess. Run! 
This, however, is where things kick off. Kami himself appears and offers him the role of Earth's guardian, which of course he refuses and is a nice reminder of where he's at mentally prior to the Cell Arc's rejoining moment. But he also notes that the Mizoku are on the move again, introducing the man of the hour, it's Garlic Jr. Turns out he escaped the dead zone due to the alignment of the planet Machio that powers up his race. How's that for crazy lore? After Popo gets his ass kicked, sorry TFS fans, Kami rolls up on the lookout and wow, we actually get to see him fight again. I hope you're starting to see why this arc might actually be kind of cool. Well, as it turns out, this spicy gnome wants to take over the earth once again. Not exactly a novel concept, but the way he wants to go about things is what makes this so interesting. In my opinion, at least. Mr. Garlic pours this aqua mist, or the black water mist from the dub, down from the lookout and starts turning the people below into demons. This facilitates what I think is a pretty neat character moment for Gohan. His very own mother and friends begin to turn into demons in front of his very eyes and attack him and Krillin. For a young boy that once struggled to even leave his father's side, to remain calm and collected in this moment is honestly awesome to see. It fits in nicely with the development Gohan saw throughout the Frieza arc. But as the demon henchmen roll up, so too does Piccolo, and the arc's main three are finally in place with a clear goal. Beat Garlic Jr. and undo the transformations. <laughs> Well, uh, there goes one of the gang at least. In a last ditch effort to buy Gohan and Krillin time to get away, Piccolo ends up bitten. And what ensues is one hell of a battle. Initially just Gohan versus the henchmen, things quickly turn into pupil versus mentor, and eventually Gohan versus mentor and friend. The once crybaby son is forced to stand alone against impossible odds. What a captivating idea. And yet... <laughs> This is so big brain. All this time Piccolo was pretending and mid-battle convinced Krillin to play along too. All in aid of rescuing Popo and Kami. I love this so much. We're so often told that Piccolo is a smart character, but man, to see it in action like this and so prominently is amazing. Look at what it offers the story. As a result of this plan, Piccolo had to put all his faith in Gohan and stand strong in the face of adversity, unaware of his trickery and he never gives up. It's such a perfect distillation of who these two characters are. Two individuals enjoying a pivotal moment for both of their respective characters that reveals their underlying strengths. For Gohan, it's his courage, and for Piccolo, it's his intellect. Round of applause for Sumisawa on this one. But now, with the release of Kami and Popo, they must head off on their own mini subplot through the depths of this strange dimension of the lookout to retrieve the super holy water, the cure to garlic's evil machinations. Unfortunately, while this offers some cool visuals, it largely amounts to cutaways of the pair just... Uh, running? A whole lot of running! Okay, and some flying too. Mercifully, the battle against garlic is awesome, however. The animation during this section is so good. It's honestly kind of nice to have a battle set in a location like this, given most of Dragon Ball's battles take place in the wilderness. And man, does this battle really reach crazy heights. Gohan literally impales Garlic, and this dude just walks it off due to his immortality and the crazy power buff from the planet Machio. Since Popo and Kami have succeeded at this point, and the Earth is beginning to be healed, Garlic goes crazy and creates another dead zone to try and suck in the lookout. With Piccolo starting to fade away, he gives Gohan one last big brain move. Blow up the planet, buffing him. And with one incredible Masenko, the planet is obliterated. And with Krillin and Piccolo back in action, the trio send Garlic flying back into the dead zone for good. It's such an awesome teamwork finisher to what has essentially been side character teamwork, the arc. It really did genuinely surprise me how much I enjoyed this one. Garlic Jr. isn't exactly the most interesting character, his henchmen are about as interesting as paper, and the power scanning doesn't make much sense at all, but that never really got in the way of what was a fascinating character-driven tale for me. And even its momentary cutaways to Vegeta are chock full of interesting commentary. I don't know if it's just because I've never seen it in Japanese before, but this really felt like an entirely different experience. It's the best of these filler arcs so far, and I urge you to give it another shot if you're down on it. Its ambitious concepts and fun ideas, both narratively and visually, felt super refreshing. And it didn't negatively impact the canon material in any meaningful way. I don't think I can ask for much more from a filler episode 8.5 out of 10 great filler 
All right, time to look at some uh, a a Android filler. <laughs> We now move away from the filler arcs and into standalone episodes once again. And amusingly, these first two episodes could not be more different. Episode 124 might as well be called The Depressed Prince because, oh boy, this sad nugget of a man literally hospitalizes himself trying to become stronger than Kakarot. And while that's kind of hilarious, the episode is honestly really well directed and a pretty neat concept, all things considered. While asleep in the hospital, Vegeta experiences this trippy nightmare of chasing Kakarot and Trunks, only to find them impossible to reach. Before his very eyes, they transform into Super Saiyans and fade off into the distance as Vegeta screams in anguish over his inability to reach their level. He remembers his father's words as a child, proclaiming he will one day be the strongest and even may attain Super Saiyan. The whole thing surprisingly moving and is undercut and contrasted with moments of Piccolo, Goku and Gohan training together happily. It's the kind of thing Toriyama would never write. This tortured metaphorical trip through Vegeta's mind is pretty antithetical to Dragon Ball's tone entirely, but I really love when Filler does this. Offering fascinating insight into a character's mind and contrasting his isolation with the teamwork the others are using to improve themselves is super fitting and I think only adds to the story itself. And on the complete opposite end of the tonal spectrum is episode 125, the driving episode. <laughs> I would love to pretend there's some sort of lengthy insight I could provide for this, but it genuinely is just nonsense wacky perfection for like 20 minutes straight. Seeing Goku in civilian clothes always looks so strange to me, but Piccolo manages to pull off the yellow-purple combo hilariously well. The whole thing's a total car crash of an episode, pun absolutely intended, and if you somehow haven't seen it, please go check it out. It has got to be the funniest of all these filler episodes by a country mile and has solidified itself in the fandom's memory for good reason. I'd give the first episode a solid 7 out of 10, and the driving episode is as good as comic Dragon Ball gets. 9.5 out of 10, easy. Jumping ahead now to the remainder of the Android Arcs filler, we now find ourselves exploring what the gang is up to in the gap before the Cell Games begin. The first episode in this batch sees Gohan grope, I mean, uh, save a girl called Lime. And while that bizarre gag might lead you to think this is a lighthearted affair, it's actually a reasonably serious addition to the story. Unfortunately, Lime's parents were killed by Cell and now her village is being overrun by a tyrant named Borbon charging extortionate prices to let people into his protective dome to escape Cell's wrath. I honestly really like this as a concept for a filler episode. It's not often we really get to see the full extent of how Cell's terror has affected the wider world outside of the main characters, both from the perspective of people who've lost loved ones as well as the panic and exploitation that takes place as a result of it. This is all explained to Gohan through the character of Lao, an old man who took in Lime after her parents passed, and who Borbon is extorting for money from the shelter. Because apparently charging high prices to get in isn't enough. He's got to rip off the entire village village to even build it in the first place. And to make matters worse, this asshat has hired Tao Pai Pai as his bodyguard. Lao is honestly such a great character. There's a real gravitas to his screen presence that makes him feel so effortlessly watchable. He's a classic master martial artist in every way, and it's awesome to see him take on the villains of this tale single-handedly. It's an episode where Gohan doesn't throw a single punch. It truly is the story of the people of this village through and through, and I kind of love it for committing to that. Gohan's sole role is really just just to scare Tao Pai Pai off as he realizes he's Goku's son. Otherwise, he largely just exists as a vessel to push the story along and inspire. As a result, it's hard to sort of quantify why this episode is so incredibly good. It feels so perfect for Gohan's pacifist nature, all the while adding to the texture of the Dragon Ball world. It's an 8.5 out of 10 for me. It feels like it truly understands Dragon Ball's characters and world, and it's another big win for Sumi Sawa's writing, would you believe?
Unfortunately, while Gohan-centric episodes are appreciated, episode 171 doesn't really land in the way I would have liked. The concept on paper sounds interesting enough. It's a birthday party for Gohan, and Chi-Chi spends the time reminiscing about moments from Gohan's childhood we've never been privy to before. But that's not really what the episode ends up being, sadly. Instead, we spend much of the time spinning our wheels on disparate scenes of Goku riding a fish, Cell being bothered by the press, or Chi-Chi being flanderized to unbearable levels. While there are some genuinely sweet moments like the last few minutes of the episode where the party actually takes place, it sadly doesn't make up for the meandering snooze fest that leads up to that point. A regretful 4 out of 10 for this one. Thankfully, however, Bright Skies await in the final episode of the Android Filler. <laughs> Episode 174 is a genuine delight. Some cool scenes with Mr. Satan and a sick trunks training sequence kicks off this episode, making it worthwhile from the get-go. But that's not even what this episode is about. Goku's off searching for the Dragon Balls and ends up rolling in on Tao Pai Pai and some gangsters in their secret base. What ensues is pure hilarity. It is so good. <laughs> Uh, Goku doesn't even seem to register the threat, he just wants the Dragon Balls they have and seems to view this whole situation as some peaceful negotiation, which I guess it, it kinda is given Tao Pai Pai is, well, it's just so stupid, I love this. Instead of fighting Goku, he gives him a uh, puzzle to complete? If he solves it, he gets the Dragon Balls. Of course, at this point, the mob and Tao sneak out and drive off as far as they can, only for Goku to solve it, appear next to them, and take the Dragon Balls. Again, without even registering they were trying to con him. I don't normally love Goku being portrayed quite so stupidly, but the sheer naivety being played up in such a slapstick manner straight up killed me. This is easily a 9 out of 10, and I wish it was up there with the driving episode for most fans, cause it's just too good. The Otherworld Tournament The Otherworld Tournament, or Afterlife Tournament as it's otherwise known, is a strange one. Not because it's clearly bizarre, or because it's Dragon Ball Z's only conventional tournament arc with a clear-cut ending. Nope, it's strange because I remember this arc boring me to tears as a kid for whatever reason, and upon revisit, it's held up considerably well. Now, for all the other world tournament fans out there, I'm not trying to suggest that this arc is perfect or remotely measures up to the other canon tournaments of Dragon Ball's past. It's got its flaws, not the least of which is a distracting and palpable lack of consequence and stakes that is felt throughout the tournament from beginning to end. However, it's that very distinct lack of consequence and tension that emphasizes how brave a choice it was to have a filler tournament feature so prominently. Because fundamentally and structurally, I don't think a filler Dragon Ball tournament can be written to meet the expectations set by its predecessors. Tournaments aren't compelling because they show strong opponents facing off against other strong fighters. Instead, it's the underlying story that takes place and how that story impacts the main characters in lasting ways, informing the events of the arcs to come like a ripple upon a pond set in motion from the purposeful throw of a pebble. But the uphill battle this arc faces is that it doesn't really have a pebble from which to create interesting ripples. Nor can it afford to because there can never be lasting consequences from a piece of filler as we've outlined. By the arc's end, we need to return to the status quo. Other arcs have successfully gotten around this issue, like Gohan's training under Piccolo where the consequences of this activity had already been offered by the canon material. The filler just filled in the gap. And this is true for all the other filler arcs largely, finding safe and comfortable positioning between two canon moments, one offering a launching pad into the story and another offering the impending consequence from which it can draw inspiration from. For example, following Goku's defeat of King Piccolo, he seeks the tutelage of God to help him prepare for the 23rd Tenkaichi Budokai against Piccolo Jr. Once there, it's demonstrated to us what Goku is lacking. This, therefore, naturally transitions into a filler arc that works towards establishing the training and lessons he needs to learn, which, as I've mentioned, are pointed out later. This is to say, the setup and consequences are taken care of. However, in this other world tournament, there is no setup beyond Goku looking to occupy all all of this newfound time in his hands, and there can't be consequences because the story we transition into later doesn't follow Goku, or at least not right away anyway. So if I've spent all of this time talking about the structural problems with this arc, how did I have so much more fun than I was anticipating? Well, this might sound like an unsatisfying answer, but it's just fun.
While the story is light and challenged in almost every area, Aya Matsui, the sole writer behind this filler story, must have known what she had to work with as she leaned into its strengths consistently. Apart from being wall-to-wall -wall funny with Goku shenanigans in other worlds, check-in station and airport now acting as a backdrop for some trademark Dragon Ball humor, it's how this story is framed that I found quite clever. This is Dramatic Irony The Arc. Almost every fight in this arc is purposely funny, and this is to place emphasis on the fighter that Goku will inevitably meet in the finals, Paikuhan, or Paikon in the dub. All the while everyone, including those in Goku's own quadrant, doubt his abilities or are put off by his nonchalant manner of speaking and presentation, doubting his abilities next to these more traditional fighters as a result. This, my friends, is the feedback loop which fuels Goku's fights in this tournament. One of the Kais doubts Goku and presents him with one of their champions, only for them to be blown away by how capable Goku truly is. And that doesn't really get boring as fast as you'd think for two reasons. Number one, the gags are on point. When Goku's first opponent put himself into a cocoon only for him to be DQ'd due to it taking thousands of years for him to emerge, that had me rolling around on the floor laughing. This helps the story to feel less serious and light. And number two, the leading reason I think this feedback loop works for four to five episodes is because as an audience, we're in on the joke with Goku and King Kai because we know something all the other Kais and all the other fighters don't. We know where Goku came from, what he's been through, and most importantly, we know what he can do. That's a really powerful feeling for the audience to experience. And with Paikuhan's fights all being totally different to that which Goku and the others have enjoyed, as an audience, we look to him as our white whale to look out for. We are waiting and anticipating Paikuhan, the champion heralded as one of the best fighters, to have that same exasperated look on his face when Goku reveals who he truly is. Paikuhan versus Goku. This fight is spread across two episodes and honestly I'm glad it was because the art direction boards and animation of that first episode was pretty dampening all things considered. In saying that I don't want to entirely discredit that first part to their fight and it's not without its own upsides given it's the first time Goku demonstrates his ability to transform. This is a moment the arc has purposely been building to the entire time. So much so that they had to quickly color swap a previous Super Saiyan transformation in hell to keep it all a secret. This is the moment we've been waiting for Paikuhan to see, and fantastically, he doesn't flinch or crumble like the others looking on have. Instead, he eagerly welcomes the challenge. And carrying that momentum into the second and final episode of this fight, we're greeted by a massively improved level of direction, choreography, and animation in this installment. In the back half, Paikohan seems to have an answer to every challenge Goku presents him with, demonstrating in his own way that he's much faster than even Goku can contend with. This is where our dynamic with Goku as an audience member shifts for the first time, and that shift occurs when he demonstrates a move we haven't seen in a very long time. And in tandem with the Super Saiyan transformation, no less, the Kaioken. Used to escape this impressive move from Paikuhan, suddenly, much like the audience members we were so excited to see dumbfounded by Goku's abilities, we are similarly sitting there, stunned by what we are seeing. It's a cute game the arc plays with our perspective, and it's made possible thanks to the move King Kai taught him specifically, which was a fitting touch in my opinion. After Goku eventually takes this supposed victory, thanks to a well-timed Kamehameha used with his instant transmission technique, it's revealed that both competitors' feet touch the out-of-bounds, thus resulting in a double DQ finish, with no side having gained anything but a different perspective on each other. And that's the strange thing about this arc. It's ultimately hollow and offers little in terms of fleshing out the existing story like other arcs have been afforded. There are even arguments one might make that this filler arc should have concerned itself with Gohan growing up instead of spending yet more time with Goku, a character we were supposed to be moving away from. But despite all of that, it's still a ton of fun for all the reasons I've outlined. I don't think it'll leave a lasting impression on me, and like I said, it has its flaws, but overall it's a much more enjoyable experience than I recalled. 6.5 out of 10. The Boo Arc. And now we hit the point where the anime had a substantial overhaul. New series director, new character designer, the works. And well, the approach to filler completely changed too. Up until this point, there have been some pretty chonky stretches of dedicated filler arcs and standalone episodes, but those mostly just melt away in this arc, and instead they're replaced with fully fledged extensions of the canon material. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not about to pretend the previous arcs didn't drag out fights with extended battles and stare downs, or cutaways to non-combatants doing all sorts of silly stuff. 
Here's looking at you, Ginyu Frog. But that's not what I mean here. Those absolutely exist, but the way the filler works here is deeply ingrained into the story. It shows what was unseen in the manga or extends it dramatically. In some cases, it even replaces canon material with its own take on things. It's how an arc that is seven volumes long in the manga, around the same length as Frieza and Cell individually, ended up encompassing a little under half of the entire series. For example, take Gohan's Saiyaman identity being unraveled by Videl. In the manga, Gohan zooms off in disguise after Videl to aid in the takedown of some bank robbers. The whole thing's over in only a few pages and Videl catches the great Saiyaman out by using Gohan's name and getting him to respond. It's all hilariously stupid in that iconic Toriyama sort of way and wraps up super quick by Videl essentially going, uh, my guy, you literally have Gohan's voice and knew my name. Are you dumb? It's honestly incredible. The anime, on the other hand, replaces this segment with a bunch of robbers hijacking a senior citizen sightseeing bus. It is so beyond absurd, the old people on the bus don't even realize what's going on and start wondering what the tour will show them next. There are helicopter jumps, the bus shoots off a cliff. It is crazy with a capital C. After the great Saiyaman flies in to rescue the bus, he accidentally uses Videl's name, to which she wonders how he knew her name. And then the episode just, uh, it ends. What's happening here is that the anime is essentially breaking down Gohan's mistakes into individual episodes. In the very next episode, Gohan slips up and lands on the school roof as the great Saiyaman before dropping the disguise, only to notice that a classmate called Angela had seen him. What follows is Angela bizarrely blackmailing Gohan to go on a date with her. They go to the movies, to a coffee shop, and all the while Gohan keeps messing up. As cursed as this sounds, it's honestly pretty damn hilarious, but I think my favorite moment is probably where Gohan goes to ask Chi Chi for advice and she reminisces about her first date with Goku. I mean, little boy Goku had no clue what a date was and upon Chi Chi explaining it was the most fun thing you could think of, my little man throws a right hook. It is perfection. Unfortunately, the episode kind of spins its wheels by repeating the same plot point from the last episode. Danger's around, Videl's in the scene, and Gohan has to jump in. And well, turns out the secret Angela knew all along was that uh, Gohan wears teddy bear underpants. And she saw nothing on the roof because she had no contacts in. And it just keeps going like this. The next episode once again has the same plot point. Trouble occurs, Videl is there, Gohan steps in. Rinse and repeat. The final episode at least includes a plot point that pulls on my animal-loving heartstrings with a circus abusing a dinosaur. But, like, this is still fundamentally the exact same structure. For the fourth episode in a row! Four episodes of content, a whole movie's worth of runtime, for something that was essentially a gag for a few pages in the manga. There's some great comedy in spots, but unfortunately four episodes just nukes the pacing and kind of murders the idea that Videl is a smart cookie. I'd probably give this segment a 4 out of 10. It has its moments, but boy is it a slog at times. Goku versus Majin Vegeta. For many, this doesn't even register as filler, and it's easy to see why. I mean, it's one of the most highly anticipated rematches in the series, and in the manga, it amounts to a quick page or two of flurries, and then it ends. It is chock full of fantastic dialogue, absolutely, but it is not a fight, really. And while it's easy to argue that that's the point, and maybe I'd agree, I think this is one aspect this adaptation really excels in. All the battles in this arc just feel huge. The various animation staff involved in this particular bout truly gave it their all. It is full of iconic sequence after iconic sequence that just builds and builds across several episodes. I think it works super well from the angle of fan service, but also in the sense of adding real weight to the power that ultimately gives rise to Majin Buu. While I can definitely see arguments against extending this to such an extent, personally I just think the entertainment factor outweighs it entirely. It's gotta be at a minimum a 9 out of 10. The animation is just too good and the tension so palpable that it might as well just be the de facto version of events. And now it's time for the awkward bits. Now, this is where it starts to get kinda hard to throw titles up, you see? The filler genuinely becomes so completely sporadic and ingrained in the content that it's almost impossible to talk about it individually without this video being like 9 hours long. Which hey, you might enjoy, but I value sleep, so how about a quick fire round? Episode 239. Roshi does horrible things to Android 18, while Bulma and Videl take on a suspiciously well-animated dinosaur. It's a pretty looking episode, but it offers very little outside of video evidence that Roshi should be in jail. Episode... Uh, well, basically all the episodes for the time being. Boo turns people into candy and terrorizes the city. Over and over 
and over and over and over and oh, just make it end. Episode 251. Gotenks is born and immediately goes to fight Boo. This is off screened in the manga because it's literally a gag about his cockiness. The anime shows it, it undermines the whole gag, it's not even a good fight. Episode 252, Mr. Satan becomes Boo's best buddy. This episode is basically the entire concept from the manga stretched out into almost a full episode and it is glorious. I mean, it actually animates the Mr. Satan video game. Great extension, no complaints here. Episodes 256 and 257. Why did we need two episodes of Boo walking around the lookout? Why? Episode... Uh, go tank stuff. <laughs> this time chamber fight is super drawn out and all the cutaways are just Gohan sat still waiting. I mean, I like go tanks, but not for four episodes straight of the exact same stuff. But hey, like I mentioned in my review of this arc, I do love the reaction to him learning that his family is now gone. Hooray for sadness episode Vegito stuff. Did you know that Vegito only lasts for two chapters in the manga? Well, you get him for four episodes in the anime. Wow, four episodes. This show really loves four episodes of things. Well, maybe it's hypocritical to say, but four episodes of Vegito are way cooler than four episodes of Gotenks. You know what else lasts for four episodes though? The inside of Boo. There's actually a fully dedicated section of filler here that was originally just a single chapter in the manga. And while most of it is mind numbingly dull, episode 27 and four has the gang battling phantom versions of their kids and it's kind of awesome. What follows are mostly just battle extensions that thankfully are pretty sick too. The added content to the fight in the Kaioshin realm produced one of the best looking episodes in the series, episode 279. And that's true for a lot of the fights in the climax here also. The anime really turns things up to 11 and produces extended content that adds some awesome weight to the show's final battle. But well, I'd be remiss to not mention the insane cutaway to Ghost Dabra hanging out with the ghost girlie. It kills the pacing, but I won't lie, it is pretty funny. And hey, who doesn't love watching Cell and Frieza standing there salty as all hell in hell? <laughs> and well, that brings a close to the quickfire round as we now jump into the final dedicated filler episode of Dragon Ball Z's entire run, episode 288. This final piece of fully original content sees the gang throwing a party, which apparently they love to do given that this is also the premise of Yo Son Goku and his friends return special and Battle of Gods. And you know what? Maybe that's the key to good Dragon Ball content because this episode is pretty fire. There's something just so sweet and wholesome about Chi Chi picking out what she needs to wear while Gohan and Goten get dressed. It's a rare bit of normality we don't often get a glimpse of and the fact that this is all happening while Goku is off out poking around in nature just feels so in keeping with his character and a nice throwback to the early days of his life. And well, I think that's the point. Goku sits and reminisces about how this is the very mountain Grandpa Gohan found him on all those years ago. He reflects on how his grandpa may have been strict, but he was also super kind. It even shows him being given the iconic Nyoibo, allowing this section to all feel like a perfect way to reflect back on what has been an incredibly long journey. Not just for the characters, but for the people who watched the show on the air at the time. As the party rages on, there are so many adorable interactions like Bulma barbecuing, Ten Shinhan giving Krillin pizza, Majin Buu trying to take Vegeta's food, and Vegeta actually agreeing. I mean, it's all just so lovable, and of course gave rise to the absolutely iconic Disco Ball Z moment. While the second half gets a little tiring seeing the dinosaur plot continue once again, I mean, it's, it's sort of important, I, I think, uh, Goku finally arrives and tells the gang the story of how he saved the dinosaur babies, and it sort of feels symbolic for him fostering in a new generation, a pivotal theme of the series' finale. What follows is Goku joking about being dead when Goten was born, before Goku kindly welcomes Vegeta to stop standing by himself. And well, I think when combined with the beautiful music and the narrator celebrating Son Goku's charm, it's a perfect way to wrap up this era as the show heads into its time skip and eventually the end of the series. 7.5 out of 10, it's pretty cute. Dragon Ball Z's filler gets a bad rep and it's not exactly surprising given some of the content I've outlined today. A lot of the series features mind-numbing extensions of content that was meant to be short or cutaways to content that disrupts the flow and pacing of certain stretches. The stuff can be brutal and it certainly sticks with people given it's sort of being exaggerated in people's minds to the point that they think characters genuinely power up for multiple episodes at a time now. But I think what's become clear for me in these past two videos is that there's actually a lot to love about 
Dragon Ball's dedicated filler material, especially in the context in which I've just viewed it in. You see, for most people, filler is something that gets in the way. It's a blockade of sorts to the next point in the story, whether that be nine episodes of training before Nappa and Vegeta arrive, or ten episodes of Garlic Jr. while you wait for the Android arc to begin. It's pretty hard to find much enjoyment in disruption. But as I've sat down and watched many of these self-contained arcs and episodes in isolation, I found that they work surprisingly well that way, especially those arcs conceived of and written by a single person. I'm enjoying so much of what they have to offer the characters and the world on their own, even if I know that when placed in context, they don't serve the narrative pacing in the best of ways. I do, however, think that that's definitely the right move for shows that need filler so as not to catch up with the manga. Rather than pad out canon material to the point it hurts the story and tortures the viewers, instead create meaningful arcs between content like Dragon Ball did. It has the benefit of being able to be skipped over without issue once a show is done airing, and it offers great standalone viewing for those who want to watch it at a later date. It helps your series stand the test of time better, I think, even if it has historically come at the cost of poor ratings, the main reason many shows nowadays don't take this approach. But what kind of content do you prefer? Are you with me on this one, or would you rather stick with canon content? Content, even if it comes at the cost of being slower than intended. Let me know down in the comment section below and thanks so much for joining me on this bizarro detour through Dragon Ball Z's filler. It's been a long old journey through Dragon Ball over the past few months and I am more than ready to jump into something new. So be sure to stay tuned as next week we're diving into a special new series.